We were very happy to hear that Ryan Lutz of the NSTU was just invited to speak to the committee as well, since he hears from the teachers around this province every day and can give a more comprehensive testimonial than we can. Thank you, Ryan, for being here. Paul and I will attempt to give a quick glimpse of some of the challenges that we as teachers are facing, although of course we can only really speak here for ourselves. We would like to start by acknowledging that teachers are by no means the only ones struggling. Now that was a piece from the Standing Committee on Human Resources as uh, we were talking or they were talking about education this week and that's part of the focus this time on Thinking Out Loud here on the Saltwire Network. Hi there, and uh, welcome to Thinking Out Loud, presented to you here exclusively on the Saltwire Network. And of course, I'll remind you of our YouTube channel where you can watch videos from all of my colleagues at uh, Saltwire. Uh, also, we have uh, podcasts that you can find on all the podcast platforms, so we'll remind you of that as we get started here uh, to talk a little bit about education. And uh, there was a rather um, interesting story, I'll put it that way, uh, at Saltwire this week, Workload low substitute pay hampering Nova Scotia teacher recruitment plan. This is according to the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. And uh, the president of that union, uh, Ryan Lutz, was uh, there as a witness to speak to the uh, Standing Committee on Human Resources. And although those committees don't necessarily get a lot of time uh, in the news, what happens there sometimes becomes part of a jumping off for reporters to learn more. And one of the folk who was there at this event is also a member of this group, about uh, called Educators for Social Justice in Nova Scotia. And I've had the pleasure of speaking in the past with uh, yeah. Megan Neves, who has been uh, very much a, a social justice advocate. And thank you very much for, for speaking with me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. To start off, uh, a lot of chatter on social media about absences. I know that wasn't what the committee was on, but it was about human resources. Are you seeing colleagues out? Are you seeing students who are not uh, in class these days? Oh my gosh, yes, uh, more so than ever in my teaching career. Um, yeah, there's been tons of absences uh, every week, you know, and then people will come back and then there will be other kids that are missing. Um, and then in return, it's it's teachers uh, because we're catching the flus and the colds and everything that's going around right now. And then uh, we're off. And then also teachers have uh, children and families of their own. So their children may be bringing home some of the viruses and things that are spreading. And uh, yeah, and then it leads to our um, sub shortage issue that we talked about at the legislature. Now, part of this conversation, uh, there was a quote from someone who's involved with the Department of Education saying you should coach your children and neighbors and friends and tell them this is an incredible profession. Uh, teaching now is not what it was before. I know that was part of the commentary at that uh, that committee hearing. So so what is Megan seeing? How, how have things changed since you've been a teacher? Wow. So um, I compare it to even you know, growing up as a student, because this is only my sixth year uh, in a permanent position. I, I was a substitute prior to that, and I had term positions prior to that as well. Um, but overall, um, it's headed in the right direction as far as we understand all of the ways in which we have diverse learners in the classroom that we need to plan for. Um, but that requires a lot of time. And also, you think about um, the way that I was taught from primary to grade nine, as well as in my university experience that trained me and qualified me to be a teacher, was all through that Eurocentric perspective. And so therefore, there's a lot of biases that were fed to us uh, that now we kind of have to unlearn, and then we have to relearn. So uh, on our own, time we have to kind of learn the black history the indigenous history all of the things that we you know didn't grow up included in our education and then we have to relearn that and then we have to reteach so it requires some time to kind of dismantle some of that cycle of only speaking through that Eurocentric perspective. And then on top of that, um, I don't know what it was like for teachers back then, but now like just to paint a picture, um, most teachers have almost up to 30 kids in their classroom. Um, you know, for me, usually the cap's at 30. So um, then we're teaching like in junior high anyways, uh, six classes each. Um, 
and six class of students. So that's between 150 to 180 students that we are um, planning for. And mind you, like with diversity in the classroom, so we have to plan um, accordingly to who is who is in front of us. But also we're assessing 150 to 180 um, students at the same time. We're communicating with the parents. We're reporting on uh, the progress and some of the challenges and the improvements along the way. Um, so and, and with very little prep time. Uh, so there's there's no way you can really do your job well unless you are um, working outside of our contracted hours. Megan, I think we need to probably slay some dragons or at least talk about some of the misnomers out in, in the public about teaching. You're talking about prep time and lead time, but you know, you'll hear from uh, people who say, well, you get all these days off, you are done at 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, you get the summers off. It's it, You know, some people have this impression that teachers are not necessarily working a full-time career while they're teaching full-time. Right. I wish they could spend a day in the classroom. Oftentimes, I when I see those things in the public, I say, you know, sometimes I wish there was cameras in here so they could just see what, what one day looks like. And one day never looks the same as the next day. Um, and there's never a dull moment. And that's one of the joys uh, about junior high at the same time is, you know, it's always entertaining, but it's always challenging. Um, and teachers are feeling the burnout from all of the things that were talked about at the legislature. When the public account, or sorry, I keep calling it public accounts, but when uh, the, the, the Committee on Human Resources calls for witnesses and it asks for information and you're sitting there and you're giving testimony, and that's what it is, what is it that you hope to accomplish? What do you feel that role entails? What do you feel should be perhaps, you know, the message to the folks that are there? Well, I think similar to what you were just talking about is a lot of people have no idea what it's like uh, to be a teacher in this day and age. And education looks different, much different than it looked 20 to 30 years ago. Um, and we've made lots of positive strides uh, towards providing a more equitable education. So all of the things that we need to do um, are important. Like we are not saying that we shouldn't be doing all this work because it's definitely important. It's the changes that need to be made. However, um, we also need time for that. So, you know, I hope that the public kind of sees the crisis of the education system, um, the impact of uh, teacher burnout and the sub shortage that is happening right now and understand like at the end of the day, you know, this is about the children and their quality of education because our working conditions are their learning conditions. And so, you know, they might want to bash on teachers and say they have this time, this time, this time, but we got to go back to the children and that's what's really important here, right? Is that, you know, some of the most, uh, the children that are most marginalized by our society are the ones that are going to suffer the most um, in, in circumstances like this. And so I can only speak from my uh, specific experience because, you know, different teachers want different things, but we're seeing a lot of the same commonalities uh, throughout the whole province of the same feelings that teachers are having. Um, and I just hope that, you know, something, something's got to change. People start prioritizing um, our education system because when we prioritize our education system, you know, our whole society will benefit from that. And, you know, it, from now and into the future. And there's been some talk about uh, reading levels, talk about how the pandemic has affected the way the outcomes, as it's described, and, and the terminology that's used. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if you feel that the there are setbacks, that there are challenges that are within the control of the teachers to help address some of those what are perceived to be shortcomings. Are you saying it's our responsibility? Like, I'm just wondering what what tools do you have at your disposal if, in fact, people are saying that the, the students, some students, are not where they should be. So and so, this is a this is a problem. Is that there's lots of different support systems uh, or people that are you know were hired for uh, that extra assistance in the classroom, um, resource teachers and student support workers and um, social workers, things like that that come into the school to provide that extra support to help with those historic gaps. However, when um, teachers are absent and we don't have the uh, number of subs to be able to cover for them, what happens is teachers on their prep time. Uh, the little time that we have, uh, we are we have to go cover for the other teacher who's absent at that time. And that means our resource teachers, our music teachers, our um, support teachers, things like that are going to cover for these classes because we need a teacher in each room. 
um, so that the kids are supervised. But in results, the students are getting those extra supports to be able to um, close some of those uh, gaps. Do you have friends or acquaintances who are substitute teachers? Mm, uh, I mean, acquaintances, yes. The reason I ask is that, uh, you know, there's this this narrative, there's this conversation that there is a, a shortage, that there are people who have an education degree who are deciding they don't want to wait in order to become substitutes or something's happening. What is your thought about why there's this shortage? Well, first of all, with the infl- like the inflation of everything and cost of gas and the cost of rent, it's not sustainable to be a substitute teacher. You can't survive. So when you get out of university and it takes six years to become a teacher, you have two years of your bachelor of education and four years of a bachelor of arts before that, you have all, unless you you just had an extra 60,000 per se, um, you know, set aside for school, which most people did not, they are graduating with all kinds of student loans and then they are not making any more than 35,000 a year and that's if they work every single day of the school year. And so that would also cost a lot of gas to uh, go from school to school for whatever is available at the time, but not uh, to mention like when then they'd have to go on unemployment. You'd have to um, have extra jobs on top of that. And they're not, there's no security there. There's no job security there. And so people are going to other provinces uh, because we actually have one of the lowest, I think the lowest uh, paid rate for subs. So even New Brunswick place pays higher uh, for substitute teachers than we do. Uh, I think we started to see a challenge with the specialist teachers, like, you know, finding a substitute who can teach French or as you've explained it, some of the other uh, more specific classes. And here we have, you know, this, this impression that, that education is not hap- It's not where it should be. Is that the feeling you have? It's not where it should be. It's not where it could be. Um, you know, right now it's, it's all we have and it's so important, but you know, if we made that extra investment, we're investing in all of the systems, right? Because um, if we had more um, school counselors, there's so much mental health uh, or mental illness in our schools these days. And that's due to a variety of things. And some of it came from the pandemic as well. Um, but we don't have enough school counselors to actually tend to the the mental health of our students. Um, and so they're burning out as well. And some, stu- some schools are left without any counselor at all. Um, and So I just feel like, you know, we need to do a lot better, uh, but we're going to need a lot more resources. We're going to need more substitute teachers. We're going to need more prep time um, because this current situation is not sustainable. And your message to the Minister of Education, Becky Drew, and what do you need her to hear from you as a teacher in the classroom today? Well, I think that, I don't know, personally, uh, I can only speak for myself. I think that, you know, Ryan Lutz is uh, an awesome, he, he spoke so well uh, for our union yesterday and I was really happy the way he represented teachers and he hears from teachers all over the province. So I'm, I'm weary just to give my own personal um, statement, but I, I will be just upfront and say that it's only speaking for myself, but I do believe that we definitely need more prep time. We need smaller class sizes because, you know, studies show that culturally relevant pedagogy is what we need to invest in schools and the approach that we need to take, especially with our diverse classrooms. And I'm uh, currently enrolled in my master's of cultural relevant pedagogy, so I really understand the importance of it. But in order to um, provide Uh, cultural relevant pedagogy approaches to our classroom, we need time to get to know our students and have one-on-one conversations with them and get to know, you know, what do they already know and so that we can build on what they know and also let them demonstrate uh, their ways of knowing. And that might not, that might look different than what we would typically give to all of our students, but if we specify and get to know our students, then we can help um, empower them to, you know, speak their truth and uh, really reach their fullest potential. So I would say more prep time, um, smaller class sizes. Um, We definitely need um, uh, more substitute teachers. And so that means that the the wages need to go up for that. There has to be more security. Perhaps that means uh, having a, a, sub, a permanent substitute teacher at every school, um, which would also help with the behavioral issues in the classroom because if they think they're only going to see you for one day, the students I'm talking about, and then you're gone the next, then they're going to act differently than if they're going to have to see you over and over again um, because they act differently than when their permanent teacher is in the classroom. And substitutes definitely deserve that respect. 
You say you wanted to be sure to be clear that you were answering on behalf of yourself. So I'll ask you a very personal question. Are you pleased with your decision to get into education? Would you do it again? Yes, but that's because I genuinely meant when I said yesterday at the legislature, like the best part of my day is being in front of my students. I, I love them like they're my own children. And, uh, I get emotional just thinking about it because, um, I want to support them, and so that's a, the biggest, the hardest part is we care. We wouldn't be in this profession if we didn't love the kids and we didn't care truly about the youth, um, and if we didn't weren't really passionate about this profession. And so I believe that every teacher, even the ones uh, that are just signing up, you know, you have to really love it uh, to keep that endurance going. Um, but at the end of the day, you go home every night thinking, and I, I do this, and I've heard it from other teachers too, but every night I think other things come up because your day goes by so quickly and you're trying to tend and to all these needs and, and put out all these fires that there's always something that you forgot to do or there's always something you reflected on that you could have done better. Um, and teachers need that reflective time in order to do a good job. And so, you know, unfortunately, um, there's just too many things on our plate and not enough time to complete them. And so we're always going to feel like we didn't do enough. And that is heartbreaking. Um, and we carry that with us 24 hours a day. Megan, is there anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap this up? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I just think that, you know, uh, I'm glad that this message is getting out and I hope the public listens and I hope that everybody out there understands like education is so important. Education is power. And when we are, we have the education system in a crisis like this, this is going to affect our whole society. Um, and if we don't fix it, uh, we're going to see, well, we already see some um, drastic repercussions of that, but in the future, it's not going to be um, any better. Uh, Megan Neves is a teacher. She spoke to the Legislative uh, Committee on Human Resources this week, and uh, she joined me for this conversation. Thank you so much for being available and, and for speaking with me today. Thank you.